All right, three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest. His name is Derek P. Gilbert. He has just published a book on August 31st, 2019. The title of the book is Bad Moon Rising, Islam, Armageddon, and the Most Diabolical Double Cross in History. I've read most of the book. It's an excellent book. Highly recommend it. Uh, We're going to go into some details and talk a lot about the kind of ancient gods of Mesopotamia and that area and why an understanding of those entities that were worshipped by these civilizations that are referenced in ancient history and in the Bible are important to uh, the modern person, really the modern Christian, anybody. But he's a very active person. He's involved in a lot of different things. He's written a lot of books recently, uh, The Great Inception, Satan's Psyops from Eden to Armageddon, June 19th, 2017 was when that was published. The Last Clash of the Titans, The Second Coming of Hercules, Leviathan, and the Prophesied War Between Jesus Christ and the Gods of Antiquity. That was October 31st, 2018. And then The Day the Earth Stands Still, Unmasking the Old Gods Behind E.T.'s UFOs and the Official Disclosure Movement. That was December 10th, 2017. I've read that book. Also an excellent book. And Derek and I kind of go back uh, about 10 years. He was one of the first people who uh, interviewed me when I published my first book, Prophet of Evil. I think I was still printing it out on a printer at that time, but I think that was on Peering Into <laughs> Darkness. And he's also done mm-hmm. A View from the Bunker, which is another podcast. And we were talking offline that he was really one of the early podcasters started in 2005. So uh, he's got a remarkable arc of a career. But getting back to the book, again, it's Bad Moon Rising, Islam, Armageddon, and the Most Diabolical Double Cross in History, available now on Amazon. And... For people who don't know your background, Derek, I kind of covered some, but if there's anything you would like to add, and then how uh, you got interested in this particular subject of Islam, Armageddon. Well, I think you covered it pretty well. I mean, I I come at this in kind of an odd way. Uh, My background is in broadcasting, but um, I guess I inherited uh, enough of my father's DNA. Uh, He was an engineer, so he loved solving problems and figuring out how things work. And I guess I inherited enough of that to uh, apply that to the world around me. Uh, my sister is actually an engineer, but uh, for me, that was too much like work. But getting into the, uh, especially once I began to understand through a study of apologetics that the Bible is more real than most of us have been taught, uh, and then a few years later, running across the work of Dr. Michael Heiser, whose work is foundational to what Sharon and I have been doing since 2005, and really we came across him back in 05 when we started PID Radio, Um, and you asked, I can tell you exactly, 569 episodes of that podcast, 552 episodes of A View from the Bunker, and we're up to 241 episodes of our Bible study podcast, the Gilbert House Fellowship, so uh, over 1,300 episodes of podcast episodes altogether that we produced over the last uh, 14 years. Um, we, We began interviewing people whose work was inspiring us and educating us. And that's how we came across Mike Heiser. Uh, This is long before he wrote The Unseen Realm. But we saw some of the early drafts of the book, uh, which at the time was under the working title, The Myth That Is True. But really, all I tried to do is apply the divine counsel concept that Mike has been um, making available to people, his research and his uh, scholarly uh, study, uh, to the Bible, to, to just see how it applies in Scripture. Okay, if we understand that the uh, small g gods of the pagan world were real, then how does this war play out in in Scripture and in our own day? And uh, it began to help illuminate some of the more perplexing events in the Old Testament. Why why did God feel it necessary to stop the Tower of Babel construction? Why did God feel it necessary to literally part the Red Sea so that the Israelites could cross— Um, why the confrontation on the summit of Mount Carmel between Elijah and the prophets of Baal, and and so on. And when you begin to understand what the pagan nations around ancient Israel believed, those events make a lot more sense. Um, Even things like, uh, why was Abraham so stressed about not having an heir? Uh, And it it goes back to, and in fact, that's a subject that Sharon and I get into in our forthcoming book. We've got our first nonfiction book coming out uh, in about a month. On uh, it's called veneration. It's about the ancient cults of the dead and how that's reflected in the Bible, both in theology and end times prophecy. Uh, but when I started looking at uh, Islam, and this was prompted by a Pew Research study uh, 
uh, that shows that unless things change at current rates of demographic change, population growth, population shifts, um, the Pew Research Center found that within the next 50 years, Islam will become the largest religion on the planet, surpassing Christianity for the first time in, in centuries. So what then, well, first time ever, actually. Uh, so if the Apostle Paul knew his theology, and he did, which principalities and powers are behind it? I mean, you know, who is Allah? Um, when looking into the work of some scholars who take a an unbiased look at Islam, most of what's out there, at least as far as popularly available histories of Islam, tend to apologize or be apologists for Islam. Uh, Karen Armstrong, for one, is a uh, well-known author who's uh, written a couple of uh, now histories dealing with Islam and uh, gives it uh, a pass on some things that uh, really deserve closer scrutiny. Um, It seemed to me that in looking at what Muhammad did in the early 7th century was freeze Arabic tribal culture, Bedouin culture, in place in the early 7th century. So I began to do some reading, and I I don't claim to be an expert, but read enough on uh, the culture of the Bedouins at the time of Abraham to realize that it's very similar Uh, very, very similar to the Bedouin culture of the Amorites of Abraham's day, uh, essentially unchanged. So with with a few minor exceptions, you know, gunpowder being one of them. But other than that, things were pretty much the same. And so I started looking at what they believed. Who were the gods worshipped by the Arab tribes in the time of Muhammad? And you can draw a straight line connecting many of the deities they worshipped in the 7th century AD to the old gods of Mesopotamia worshipped by the Amorites in the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so I just, uh, the book just followed from there. So it started right there. So your introductory chapter is really, who are the Amorites around Isaac's birth, what, 1850 BC? And you just go through and, and really talk about how these these different gods were an antagonists of Abraham and also this, uh, the biblical the biblical narrative of really pre-Christ. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, And again, this gets back to the work of Dr. Michael Heiser, who explains that if you were to ask a a Jew of the Second Temple period, that's the time from uh, between the return of the Jews from Babylon and the time of the destruction of the Temple in 70 AD, uh, so the time of the apostles and the prophets, or the the apostles and Jesus um, included in that, uh, that period of time, your, your typical Jew would say, well, yes, the garden, the fall in the garden, Genesis 3, that's important. But also, you've got the uh, the incident on Mount Hermon, Genesis chapter 6, where the, uh, uh, the the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair and chose wives, took wives of all they chose, and created the giants of old, the Nephilim. Then there's also the Genesis 11 incident, which is the Tower of Babel. And after Babel, According to uh, Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9, where Moses is recounting the history of the Israelites, reminding them of um, how God divided the nations after Babel. And we see that Genesis chapter 10, the table of nations. Here are the descendants of uh, uh, Noah and uh, his sons. There are 70 nations listed in the table of nations, which is not a coincidence. The number 70 in the ancient Near East represented the full set, the complete set, not one left out. So in other words... Here are all of the other nations besides Israel. Moses tells him in Deuteronomy 32 that when God divided the nations, he numbered them according to the number of the sons of God. Now, the, the, the phrase sons of God is not what is usually used by English translators in our Bibles. Most English translations will say number of the sons of Israel. And that's based on the Masoretic Hebrew text, which was completed around... Um, 8th, 9th century AD, but older Hebrew texts of the book of Deuteronomy uh, found at Qumran among the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint translation, which was completed by Jewish scholars about 200, 250 years before the birth of Jesus, say sons of God, which refers to supernatural beings, angels, in other words. Uh, In fact, the Septuagint makes it very clear. Uh, God numbered the nations according to the number of heavenly beings. So, what we've got after Babel is God essentially giving the world what it wants. 
You don't want to deal with me? Fine. You will deal with the so-called gods that you want to worship. But trust me, you're not going to like it. And Deuteronomy 4, verses 19 and 20 make it clear when God warns Moses or tells Moses to warn the Israelites, tell the Israelites not to fall uh, for uh, fall into worshiping uh, the sun and the moon and the host of heaven, things that God has allotted to the nations for their inheritance. In other words, God placed these fallen angels, these small g-gods, over the nations after the Tower of Babel. So that's the situation on planet Earth, following the Tower of Babel. The nations have their gods, uh, you know, Enlil and Ishtar and uh, Molech and Chemosh and Dagon and, uh, and Baal, the storm god. These were the fallen angels who God placed over the nations after the Tower of Babel incident. The uh, Jewish religious scholars from uh, Moses down through the time of Jesus understood that this was where the pagan nations around Israel got their pantheons. Gotcha. They were angels who'd been placed in charge of the nations. Psalm 82, when you read it, reads like a courtroom scene where God is condemning these fallen angels for the way they have administered what God entrusted to them. Uh, where God basically says, you've ruled unjustly, you've favored the wicked, you have not shown, uh, you, you've not uh, uh, treated the, the, the widows that taken care of widows and orphans. Uh, and then he says, you are God's sons of the Most High, all of you, yet like men you shall die and fall like any prince. This is their destiny. The death of these gods has been decreed. It's just we're waiting for sentence to be carried out. So, Bringing that into this analysis, then, my, my, my quest, I guess, was to figure out how the gods of the Arabs of Abraham's day, or rather Muhammad's day, compared to the gods of Mesopotamia of Abraham's day, and if we could draw a straight-line comparison from these uh, gods in the ancient world whose uh, nations basically tried to destroy Israel before the, the Messiah could come forth and fulfill the, prop, the prophecy of Genesis 3, of the seed of the woman crushing the, uh, the head of the serpent, the seed of the woman destroying the seed of the serpent, or those who followed the fallen angel, uh, Nakash, translated as serpent in the, uh, uh, into English, uh, because of the way Nakash is used in other passages in the Old Testament, Isaiah and uh, Numbers in particular, where it's used interchangeably with the root word behind seraphim, a type of angel, we can be pretty sure that the serpent in the Garden of Eden was not a talking snake. Right. So, it's so. An, an angelic being that Adam and Eve were, were accustomed to, uh, to uh, seeing in the Garden. Um, so before Israel could produce the Messiah, the angels or the small g gods of these foreign nations led them again and again to it. And it, it. Suddenly the Old Testament begins to make sense. It reads like a history of the rest of the world versus Israel. Right. And considering that God had told these uh, small G gods, you're going to die, you can begin to understand why they would uh, pursue that course of action. Well, it, it, what's interesting is, and it only dawned on me about uh, six weeks ago, and I had not, I, I don't think that I included this in the book. I think this came to me after the book was already off to the printer. What we see in the history of the Bible is the parable that Jesus told to the scribes and Pharisees about the wicked tenants where the owner of a piece of ground decided to plant a vineyard and he walls it around to protect it and then he goes off to a faraway country and leases it out to a number of tenants and when the time comes for the fruit to be collected he sends a servant and uh, the tenants beat him and send him away he sends another servant beat him send him away a third servant the same thing happens finally the landowner says I will send my son surely they will listen to him and the tenants conspire with one another and say, hey, if we kill him, we will get his inheritance. And then Jesus asks the question of the Pharisees and scribes, what's going to happen when the landowner returns from this faraway country? And the Pharisees and scribes, well, well he'll, they'll be destroyed. And then they perceive that Jesus was talking about them. But I think Jesus was actually talking about the principalities and powers behind them, because that is a perfect parable for what we see here on planet Earth. God created Earth as Eden, his garden. He entrusted it to these tenants, these fallen angels, or angels who fell, and they killed his son, thinking somehow they would get his inheritance. But when he comes back, they will be destroyed, and it will be turned over. The garden, Earth, will be turned over to new caretakers, which will be us, the faithful in Jesus Christ. 
Interesting. Yeah, and, and you make that point through the book is that they wouldn't have killed Christ if they knew what the total plan was, or they were surprised at uh, at the the ultimate plan of God and for all of humanity, right? Right. I think that's a key aspect of this. Uh, why would these fallen entities work together if there's more than one? And I think we can see pretty clearly in, in history and in the Bible that there are more than one. Um, why would they work together? Well, I, you know, I think the way we're taught in our church is that it's the devil and maybe demons. If we if we go that far in uh, looking at the supernatural realm, um, obviously it's the the supernatural realm, the spirit realm is far more complicated than that. It's uh, more populated than that. I think what happened after the uh, the resurrection, and as you mentioned, Paul in fact makes this clear. First Corinthians two verses six through eight, and I'm paraphrasing again that um, if the archons, the the rulers of the age. And I think in context, it's clear Paul was talking about supernatural rulers, not politicians. Uh, if the rulers of the age had understood the mystery that God was revealing through the apostles, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And, and yet they did. And again, I think this speaks to the parable that, of course, preceded the crucifixion. Even though Jesus had told them when he was addressing the scribes and Pharisees what this was all about, they couldn't stop themselves. They put him on the cross and fulfilled his mission. And we see, interestingly, in uh, 1 Peter 3, verses 18 through 20, where Jesus in the Spirit went down to uh, the abyss and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, which Peter connected to the, uh, well, the incident in Genesis 6. So clearly he was talking about those angels who sinned and created the Nephilim back in Genesis chapter 6. Those who'd been uh, allotted to the nations after Babel, who were still active on the earth, I think we're caught by surprise by the resurrection and um, collaborated to put together a new religion. And that's why I make the case, uh, I argue in the book, Bad Moon Rising, that Allah is not a single entity, that it is, in fact, an avatar, a, uh, a Wizard of Oz type avatar operated by a coalition behind the scenes, almost like a board of directors, you know, call it Allah Incorporated. And uh, they just manipulate this. Uh, avatar as needed. They found their man in Muhammad in the early 7th century and uh, put forward a religion that, quite frankly, appeals to the basest instincts in men. And uh, it's but, been a huge but, success. Yeah, it's been a success, but I think you make the great point and you make you tie it together that these the Islam is this composite of these old gods that existed from the Old Testament. So you go in... In your introductory talk, you're talking about the city of the, the moon god, the sun god, the solar god, and how these these small g gods were, uh, like you said, like a corpor incorporated or corporatized into yeah. Islam. So can you talk a little bit about kind of not just the Amorites, but also their gods, the Balaam, and, and how these, mm -hmm. are, these gods, these names are different in different cultures, but they're the same type of entities. Yeah, and I think Sharon is, uh, my, my wife Sharon has put this well, and she's the one who got me thinking in terms of avatars. And uh, it, it gets a little convoluted, and we'll, we'll touch on this when we get to the war god, but in looking at the principal gods of the Amorites who dominated the world of the, the, the uh, patriarchs, about the time that Abraham was born, the uh, Amorites came into their own in the ancient Near East, uh, the, the lands that today we call uh, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Israel, southern Turkey, northern Egypt even, uh, those were all under the control of different Amorite uh, kingdoms, uh, different Amorite families. Uh, like the Israelites, they were a tribal culture. Uh, they started out as uh, nomads, uh, herders, shepherds, eventually settled in cities and set up kingdoms, the best known of which, of course, was uh, Babylon, which was founded by uh, an ancestor of Hammurabi the Great. The principal gods of the Amorites, I think the characteristics of those gods are reflected in the characteristics of Islam. I mean, it would be easy to say that uh, Islam is a moon god religion, but I think that's way too simple because there are characteristics of Islam that are not attributed to the moon god in the ancient world. Like, you know, the violence and uh, uh, the carnality, um, the, the legalism, those really aren't attributes of the moon god. And that's when I began to look at other, uh, their other principal members of their pantheon and settled on seven that I think are whose characteristics um, are, are reflected in the way Islam has uh, grown over the last 14 centuries. I mean, there is a, 
a chief god or a dark god um, referred to, I, I call him the god because, well, that's what Allah means. It means it's based on the Arabic al-ilah, meaning the god. Um, in the ancient world, the god, the, uh, the one that was considered the creator of the other deities by the pagans of Mesopotamia was uh, Enlil to the Babylonians and the Sumerians. He was called Dagon in central uh, central Mesopotamia along the Euphrates River and then later by the Philistines. El to the Canaanites. Uh, El who had uh, held court on Mount Hermon. Uh, the Greeks knew him as Baal or as uh, Kronos. The Phoenicians called him Baal Haman. The Romans called him Saturn. So he's been around for a long time but he's associated with the underworld and in many of these cultures with human sacrifice and specifically with child sacrifice. And certainly over the last 14 centuries we've seen the covenant with death that uh, Islam has manifested in its uh, most violent forms. Um, the, uh, the, the storm god, uh, who was the king of the pantheon, uh, he was called Marduk in, uh, in Mesopotamia, or he was a storm god. The uh, storm god uh, in western Mesopotamia to the Canaanites was called Baal. Hadad was his actual name. Baal is, just means Lord, but uh, Baal is how we know him in the Bible. Uh, the Greeks called him Zeus. The Romans called him Jupiter. The, the Norse called him Thor. Uh, he emerges as the king of the pantheon in all of these cultures, which is not a coincidence. I, I think we're seeing variant versions of the same basic story. Uh, the moon god, far more important in Mesopotamia than we've been taught. I think most Christians, if we've done any kind of deeper study into the occult at all, assume because the, of the Romans uh, and Saul Invictus, assume that the sun god was important. And we see Baal sometimes described as a sun god or Nimrod described as a sun god neither of which happens to be true. And by the way, this is sort of an aside, but uh, in my research, I've never come across anything from the ancient world that shows that Nimrod was worshipped by anybody, anywhere, at any time. Interesting. In the ancient world. Now, in the modern world, I'd argue, yeah, the Freemasons venerate Nimrod, but that's a whole other topic. Anyway, uh, the moon god was more important because you were dealing with a tribal pastoral culture living in very hot, dry, desert conditions. And so you tended to move around and be more active at night when it was cooler. Plus, you had the regular 30-day lunar cycle lunar and the calendar, uh, fertility right. implications. Yeah. Islam still maintains that lunar calendar today. so It, it still does, absolutely. Factor, right? So do the Hebrews. And that was practically universal in Mesopotamia. The Babylonians, the Sumerians before them. The lunar calendar guided yeah, guided the, uh, uh, the cycle of fertility, and uh, they planned their festivals around it. So uh, the moon god, very important, but the moon god as the uh, the principal god of the founding dynasty of Babylon was the chief god of the kings who founded the city and the occult system that John the Revelator used as the symbol of the end times church of the Antichrist. And in the book, I showed that there were some rituals performed to this day, specifically the tawaf, the uh, circling or the circumambulation of the Kaaba that may go all the way back to um, not just the ancient city of the moon god, Ur, but all the way to Mount Hermon. Right, that was fascinating um, that you said that people would ascend to the top of Mount Hermon in a spiral fashion to make their water yeah. offering. You know. Credit to Sharon for this. I mean, this has been known since 1869 by uh, archaeologists and scholars. Uh, the uh, archaeologist Sir Charles Warren who also dis discovered the Moabite stone and uh, Warren's shaft, which is the water channel through which uh, David's general Joab climbed up into the city of the Jebusites to open the gates. Um, Warren climbed Mount Hermon in September of 1869, and he visited the temple on the summit of Mount Hermon. Uh, this is the highest man-made place of worship on earth. He discovered a, a stela inside the temple that uh, uh, is inscribed in Greek, so it's not older than uh, the time of Alexander the Great, uh, late 4th century BC, but it makes reference to the watchers. You know, inside this temple, there was a, there was a, a, a stone, four foot high, 18 inches wide, 12 inches deep, inscribed with uh, those who, you know, by the order of the Most High and Holy God, those who swore an oath proceed from here, which is clearly a reference to the oath sworn by the watchers, uh, the reference uh, to the Book of Enoch. Right. But while he was there, he found, a, and, and again, this temple was probably from the uh, late Greek or early Roman period. So again, not really that old, you know, 2,300 years old or something. But he said he found a much older stone wall that led up to the summit of Hermon, which is scooped out like a great big bowl. Hmm. 
probably to receive uh, libations, drink offerings. Uh, a scholar by the name of Edward Lipinski said that there, this was a practice known in the ancient world called the Yarid. Uh, it's based on the same root as the name of the Jordan River. It means to come down or to pour out. Um, and the, the uh, ritual would involve going down the mountain to a river and bringing water up the mountain. But because of the way the stone wall uh, approached the summit in a spiral fashion, you were forced to approach the summit with the summit always on your left, which is exactly how Muslims for 14 centuries have circled the Kaaba. With the Kaaba always on the counterclockwise. Counterclockwise, right? And I think, yeah. So it's an old ritual, and I think you actually put the black cube of the Kaaba going through Petra as well, which I found to be mm -hmm. pretty fascinating as well. Can you talk about that? Yeah, but credit where it's due. This is the, based on the work of a, a Canadian historian by the name of Dan Gibson. Uh, he's got a, a documentary that I recommend called "The Sacred City," which is uh, available at uh, Amazon Prime and maybe a few other places. Um, he was looking into the, uh, the the change of the Qibla. The Qibla is the direction that that uh, uh, Muslims will pray. And, you know, we who have, you know, even heard of Islam even a little bit, we know, okay, well, they, they always pray to Mecca. Well, it's known from the, uh, the Quran that at one point, about 12, 13 years into his uh, new religion, so sometime around the year 622, Muhammad changed the direction, changed the Qibla. Uh, it was previously Jerusalem, and he got angry because word got to Muhammad that uh, Jews were making fun of him. He didn't even know the direction to pray until we told him. Uh, so assumed then that uh, when he changed it from Jerusalem, he changed, turned his back, and prayed toward Mecca and the location of the Kaaba. But th there's a problem with that theory because... Honest archaeologists will admit that there's nothing been found at Mecca in Arabia dated to before about the 9th century. Um, descriptions of Mecca in the, in, the, uh, in the Quran don't fit with what archaeologists have found on the ground because they describe ar uh, agriculture taking place there and uh, uh, it was a place for uh, uh, caravan traders to uh, come and, and do business, except that uh, Mecca is off the caravan trail that existed. By the time of Muhammad, the trade in uh, the, the spices like myrrh and frankincense that came up from uh, South Arabia, Yemen and Oman, uh, along the east side of the Red Sea, that trade had died because with the growth of Christianity, people weren't burning incense anymore, not like they used to, to you know offerings for the gods. Uh, that was not a thing with the early Christian church. And so the trade in these expensive spices and uh, perfumes had dried up. What little trade there was coming from Arabia was in leather goods, and frankly, there's not enough profit margin to make it worthwhile, even if Mecca had been on the caravan route, which it wasn't. Right, and, I and think again, you, yeah, no you say, agriculture there. Yeah, sorry something to interrupt, but I think um, there's a claim within Islam, or Muhammad made the claim that it was associated, Mecca was associated with uh, Abraham, but no, there's nothing in the Bible, and not even the Roman historians or anybody mentioned or noticed that there was any anything right. of a significant that significance there. Is that correct? They they say it was a, a place of pilgrimage where people would come and, and pray to the gods and the Kaaba had three hundred and sixty idols inside it and so forth. But again, archaeologists just can't find anything to support that. I mean, they've done soil samples there and they can't find pollen grains for anything going back that far. There's just it's always been desert. Nothing has ever grown there. Uh, on the other hand, and well, and so what what Gibson did was he checked the direction of prayer, the Qibla, for the oldest existing mosques using GPS, satellite photography, and so forth, and found that for the 12 oldest mosques uh, in existence that were all built within the first hundred years of uh, Muhammad's death, um, none of them, none of them point to Mecca, and none of them point to Jerusalem either. They point to Petra. Well, when you start looking at what Petra was like back in the day, that begins to make sense. The Nabataeans had a very wealthy kingdom there that was based on their control of the north end of the spice route. Um, it was a place where agriculture was was very prominent. Uh, the Nabataeans were famous for their, um, uh, their their water storage systems, the cisterns. And it, it was a place of pilgrimage. When you go through Petra, and Sharon and I are working on a uh, our annual trip to Jerusalem, uh, we'll call it travelogumentary, uh, I, a term I wish I'd invented. Um, 
you see that inside Petra, there literally are hundreds of idols. There's never been any evidence of any other idol inside the Kaaba at, uh, at Mecca. But inside Petra, they found over 550 carved into the walls. So, uh, there, and there is another bit of evidence here that, um, again, some mainstream historians have picked up on. And there's a fourth century uh, bishop from the island of Cyprus by the name of Epiphanius who wrote a book uh, condemning heresies and, and pagan practices around the Mediterranean world. And uh, he started out in one particular section addressing the, the worship of a, uh, a goddess by the name of Kore at Alexandria. And if I remember correctly, Kore was uh, another uh, incarnation of a uh, grain goddess, uh, Demeter, I think. That, the point is that the practice involved bringing an idol up from below ground in a sacred space and carrying it around a sacred site in a circle, circumambulating a central site. And then Epiphanius wrote, and likewise, the Nabataeans at Petra will worship their god Dushara, who was born of a virgin. Now, it's understandable why Epiphanius would think that the Arabic he was translating meant born of a virgin, except that scholars now are pretty well convinced that he mistook the Arabic word for virgin, which is ka'iba, for the word cube, which is ka'aba. And so... According to this 4th century Christian bishop, we can document that there was a religious practice involving the circling of a sacred cube at Petra 300 years before Muhammad arrived on the scene. And of course, the god Dushara, when you visit the temple of Dushara, and this will be in the video that we'll have coming out just in a, uh, oh, probably a month or so from now, um, there was a spot in the courtyard in front of the temple of Dushara which looks like a cube. Now, it's been partially destroyed because of earthquakes over the years and probably because of an Arabic, or rather a, 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 a civil war inside Islam for control of the religion in the late 7th century. But uh, that is what we believe. And we're going to do more research on this. In fact, Sharon and I are planning a book on Petra for next year to dig deeper into this subject. But we believe that that's the location, the original location of the Kaaba of Muhammad. Fascinating. That's amazing. So... He, you can see that he's integrating all of these kind of desert idols and idolatry and these practices into Islam. And at that time that he started his religion in the 7th century, you make the point that almost everything else around him had already been Christianized. So the only place where this right. idol worship was was in Arabia. That that's correct? that's correct. Um, it's almost like that uh, parable that Jesus told about uh, somebody who... Um, you know, drives an evil spirit out of somebody, and it's it's like somebody who cleans their house but then doesn't defend it, and then the strong man returns with some buddies. Um, likewise, he said the evil spirit will go out into a dry and waterless place and return with seven others stronger than itself. That, in a sense, is what happened with Islam. After the uh, resurrection of Jesus and the spread of the faith of Christianity throughout the Mediterranean world, by the time of Muhammad, Christianity had been introduced into China. It was in India. Um, most of the lands of the Bible from uh, the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean were Christian. North Africa was Christian. Inroads were made into Europe. Britain was being Christianized. And suddenly, in the early 7th century, Muhammad emerges on the scene, basically creating a, a, a super tribe where uh, tribal divisions had existed before. Um, and, and again, the, the various tribes of uh, Arabia had their own pantheons. I don't think it's insignificant that the one God that was worshipped, not as the chief God, but the one God that was worshipped by all of the tribes of Arabia, according to the sources I've read, was Attar, the war god. Um, Interesting. And their loyalty to any particular chief deity extended only as far as the tribe was successful. If the tribe was defeated in war or an illness overtook them, they would switch loyalties to another god that promised them a better deal. So Muhammad came along and said, look, you're worshiping all these deities. We've got the god here in Allah. Well, that just means the god, uh, who I argue was an ex uh, just a continuation of the chief god of the Kaaba called Hubal, which is just the Baal, in, in a Syrian dialect. So wow, I think we're looking incredible. at Satan yeah. there, but uh, Satan just as one member of this pantheon, because again, you've got the war god, uh, Athtar, you've got the, uh, the the goddess of carnality and mindless violence, Ishtar Inanna, who was worshipped as Atar Shemaine, you know, Ishtar of heaven. 
by many of these uh, Arabic tribes at the time of Muhammad, the plague god Reshef, known in uh, the Semitic world going all the way back to the middle of the third millennium BC, but also known and known as a gatekeeper to the underworld, which is prophetically significant because the Greeks called that same entity Apollo. And we see him in Revelation 9 as the king of those who are in the abyss. And uh, then the uh, the Moabite war god, I include him, he seems like kind of a minor player in the Bible, Chemosh, except, and this is where things get kind of strange and weird, uh, Atar, the war god, was just the male aspect of Ishtar. Somehow, around the time of the judges, it appears, the male and female aspect of uh, Ishtar was split into Astarte, the goddess of carnality, and Atar, the war god. But on that Moabite stone that I mentioned earlier, discovered by Sir Charles Warren, Chemosh was identified or equated with Athtar, the war god. And that war god then later known to the Greeks as Ares and to the Romans as Mars. So now how does that work? How, do, how does this deity split into two, a male and a female? And uh, again, if we think of their, the forms that we can he- perceive as humans, the ones that manifested to the pagans of the ancient world as avatars, with the spirits behind them who are multidimensional, operating in space that we can't even conceive of, much less see. It makes a little more sense. Still confusing as all get out, but hey, that's what the texts say. So. Right. Well, even Muhammad himself confused things because he tried to integrate two other deities into his religion and then repented right. it and said Satan, uh, you know, deceived him and then changed, went back to this focus upon Allah. But, uh, well, actually, it was three. It was oh, three, the three oh. daughters of Allah. Oh, I didn't know that. And uh, as I point out in the book, scholars have known for a long time that uh, like Allah in the original iterations of Muhammad's teachings, Baal at Ugarit, which was an Amorite kingdom around the time of the judges, Baal likewise was known to have three daughters. Incredible. That's an incredible tie. So you're seeing this integration of these old... old deities of of the near east right into islam and i think a lot of people would not know, wouldn't believe it or know it yeah and, and it's certainly not anything that we christians are being taught because hey, we're, we don't want to be you know inconsiderate we don't want to be uh, offensive we don't want to be uh, hateful or bigoted which of course is a charge that um, some of the more strident activists on behalf of islam are more than happy to throw around to kind of throw sand in our eyes as it were and, and just to be clear uh, william I, I i didn't write this book and i certainly don't want to come across as bashing muslims because this war as paul wrote is against the principalities and powers and cosmic rulers of this present darkness not the people themselves we wrestle not against flesh and blood excellent point. the the people who are sold out to to islam um, and not all of them are violent, just enough of them to really make them a clear and present danger to our security. Uh, they're in bondage and they don't even realize it. I mean, when you think about it, they really are, they're really being used as human shields in this spiritual war by these entities who are desperately trying to, well, I, I think their their ploy by creating this this religion, I think their purpose was twofold. Number one, to spread bloodshed and hatred amongst Humanity. They've done, they've done a really good job of that. Uh, secondly, I think, is to set up their end game, which is a deception to lure Jews particularly and Christians, if we're still here on earth, uh, into welcoming the Antichrist when he comes into his own. Fascinating. And so there is this long-term plan going on. But Derek, right now we've uh, we've crossed 40 minutes very fast. I think that's an excellent place to... to <laughs> To kind of stop, I encourage people to get this book and read it. It's very full of facts, and uh, I found it to be really eye-opening. Good, amazing quotes about for about Islam as well. But is there anything you would like to add? Anything I missed? Anything that uh, you'd like to finish up with? Well, what I hope is that again that people take away what we just discussed. That I, I think. As Christians, our calling is to make disciples of all nations, and that's really hard to do when you're seeing angry, bearded young men shouting that they want to kill us in the name of Allah. Well, okay, Jesus told you this job was dangerous when you took it, and this is where the rubber meets the road. Pray for those who are called to evangelize and witness to Muslims. Pray that the Holy Spirit continues to manifest in 
Islamic nations. Many people are coming to Jesus Christ through visions and dreams. This is something that the mainstream media is not going to report, but I keep hearing these reports. Joel Richardson mm -hmm. is documenting a lot of these. As do I. As do I uh, yeah. Right. So this is a great deception. I, and here's the, the sad thing that this really tragic. Uh, I, I believe that the most plausible scenario for Islam in the end times in any end times scenario that doesn't factor in what's about to become the world's largest religion is really missing a big piece of the puzzle. And I think the most plausible scenario is that Muslims will be sacrificed by these gods that they followed to try to deceive Jews into welcoming the Antichrist as their Messiah. I mean, as far as the fallen are concerned, Muslims are already in their camp. They're already lost. They're already bound for destruction. So the only value that they have is to try to destroy the people that they've been trying to destroy ever since God called Abram out of the city of the moon god in northern Mesopotamia, Haran. Yeah, and you still see that conf conflict happening right now. You were in Israel where rockets were fired over uh, the Golan Heights, right? Wasn't that last year? Last year when we were there, yeah. The, uh, it, it, <laughs> the funny thing is the Israelis are like, eh, it's another day. You know, school wasn't even canceled. Uh, the only thing that affected us the day that the uh, IDF detected Iranian troop movement and the Syrian side of the border was that they wouldn't allow us to go up Mount Bental, which is an observation post. But there's also a tourist site up there where you can go up there and look and see where a key battle took place in the 1967 war. You can look down on the fertile fields and agriculture of, uh, south of southern Syria. You get a beautiful view of Mount Hermon from Mount Bental, which was really, really cool. Um, but that was the only thing, that, that's the only way we were affected. I mean, Israelis, they're used to it. Uh, it was as peaceful as can be in Israel. When we walk through Jerusalem, you see a lot of young families, mothers pushing strollers and uh, uh, people just uh, enjoying walking where the where the prophets and the apostles once walked. Um, it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's, we're it's, really it's, in prophetic it, times. I mean, it's incredible to see that Israel, what, 1948 and fighting these Arab wars and these differing religions. It's uh, pretty heady, heady events. Uh, in the past and present. It, it truly is, and, and we were blessed to be a part of it. So, um, again, I just am really struck by how archaeology corroborates the the history that's recorded in the Bible. And the more we see of uh, uh, what's coming out of the soil, it, it's, well, th this came to me when we were in Jerusalem and we were looking around at the, the old city and the digs taking place there that date back to the time, almost to the time of David. Uh, the, in a sense, to paraphrase the words of Jesus, the rocks are crying out and testifying to the stories that we got in the Bible. I mean, we were able to walk um, on the site of Joshua's altar. Now, they've reconstructed the altar that was discovered by uh, the late uh, archaeologist Adam Sertal back in 1980 on Mount Ebal. And for our tour group to, to say, repeat those words, you know, choose this day who you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers in the land beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And for our group to say that right there on that spot was just, I mean, that that, that was yeah, chilling. Yeah, it was just chilling. amazing. Shivers, just that's amazing. What a blessing. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. Uh, one of the phrases I love from your book was, geopolitics is really theopolitics. And I think that uh, that's a very important truth to understand. But uh that's a great way to end it, Derek. Thanks so much for the interview. Again, the title of the book is Bad Moon Rising, Islam, Armageddon, and the Most Diabolical Double Cross in History. You'll get an understanding of biblical uh, events, also about the gods of the Near East. It's an excellent book, and uh, I congratulate you for writing it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, okay. credit to you know God for opening my eyes to some things and finding a way to use the strange wiring between my ears in a in a productive way <laughs> right and you can also listen to uh your podcast again is peering into darkness with over 500 shows and a view from the bunker on all kinds of very important issues i uh i'm a long time listener myself i probably have listened to thank you at least a third of them so i'm a regular wow. listener yeah. thank you so it's on there so anyway derek p gilbert bad moon rising thanks so much thank you all right